start with the next session. Uh, this is Mr. Bon Bapit. He has flown down from Delhi to give us this art tutorial and join us for the hack night. So he'll be doing the art tutorial right now. And let's get started. Uh, hi, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I hope nobody's going off to sleep, uh, which is very really obvious. And uh, thank you. At uh, Hazi for inviting me. It so happens that they contacted uh, Gaurav at Jigsaw uh, Academy, with whom I am a trainer for art, and then uh, things followed. Okay, so I am I'm basically a, a freelance uh, consultant. I work on projects in art, and uh, look, that, that, that's my bread and butter, and then I also do some training. Uh, before we get into this, I would like to first understand how many of you are actually our users. Is three of us here? Three, four of us here? Okay. So that's going to be a bit of a challenge for me, but that's okay. Uh, okay. So, and, and uh, have you guys used some, uh, and what kind of things have you used? They'll just go, I can ask. Um, I use that for statistical analysis. Okay. So we use R to analyze that. Initially, we use it for data exploration to find outliers, uh, for finding like fraud and that kind of stuff. Um, and I have tried to automate some of some of those parts, uh, but it's mostly for uh, data exploration and finding out where the anomaly is. Right? Once we come up with the algorithm, that kind of stuff, then we would code it back in like C plus plus or Java to make it more efficient. Because okay. uh, we didn't have a, uh, it was not uh, none of us was sophisticated enough to integrate R into the production. So okay. like, so let's uh, get down to what all can be done. So I guess you'll have to go uh, much slower than what I have planned. So what I have is a fairly large stuff which can probably uh, consume three or four hours as well. So we'll, we'll decide. Uh, the pace, maybe after 15 minutes you tell me whether the pace is good, slow, etc. And maybe you can speed it up. You can skip a lot of things and go through uh, some slightly esoteric things as well if you like that. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a statistician to start with, so I like to talk of things like you generate continuous data, you generate uh, or discrete data and so on. That, that's what uh, appeals to me better. So let's talk about you generate continuous data to start with. Okay, so you have, you have something on a continuous scale that has been measured. For example, birth rate. Birth rate of some 2,700 uh, children born at some particular hospital or something like that. Okay, so then there's a data set BW, data vector, okay, and then BW gives me the number of uh, data points that are there in that data set. Uh, obviously, what one would do if one is purely looking at the numbers is to look at the summary of that data set. And it will give you the numbers minimum, maximum, median, uh, mean, and so on and so forth. But that still doesn't give you too much of a picture, right? So, a simplest way of visualizing it is to look at the box plot of a uh, generated data. Okay. The box plot is looked at by calling the box plot function. The argument value passes the vector bw. Okay. And then I want it horizontal instead of vertical, which is the default. So I say horizontal is true. Notch true will give me this notch here. Okay. So that, that actually much better shows what is the what is the mean. Uh, the width of the box, as you would know, is the or the 
the distance from this to this is the distance from Q1 to Q3, the first and the third quartile. And then there are whiskers which are up to one and a half times the uh, interquartile range. All this can be changed. You can specify what you want to be your endpoints of the boxes and so on and so forth. And these things that you see here are the outliers. So it's a very, very obvious and simple way of <coughs> identifying outliers. Okay. Well, we are on the box plot, but uh, there are three different types of box plots which are commonly looked at. Uh, the first one is the box plot that you looked at, uh, you have seen. The second one, uh, okay, before I get into the three types of box plots, there's something called PAR. Okay. PAR is something like a low level uh, function which prepares the plot area. PAR stands for plot area. And whatever you do in R, base R, with plotting is like incomplete. Okay. You tell it, I want to plot this, it puts in there, and once it has been put out there on the paper, you can't erase it. Okay. You can always tell that I want to prepare things in a certain manner and not put in there. That is also doable. But uh, the default is it will put in on paper and after that you can't erase it or you can't change it. Okay. So you start by saying uh, I want a plotting area, make a frame, row wise, with three rows and one column. MF row, three one. Okay. C is a combining operator. Okay. So I essentially have three rows frame. So this entire thing that you see, uh, in fact, throughout this, okay, this presentation has been created in tech with uh, all the figures created as PDFs and imported in uh, this presentation. Okay. So uh, on, on this side, of course, I'm showing you the code, but the entire figure that you see here would be created as one figure. Okay. I'm not adding two, three figures on one slide at all. Okay. So how do you put these three figures together in one plot area? This is how you do it. Uh, then of course the box plot that you saw. The second one is uh, an adjusted box plot which is available in the robust base package. Now adjusted box plot has the capability of or is designed to look at not only the uh, median and the quartiles but also looks at the skewness of the data. Okay? Therefore it is better. You can see that the number of outliers that uh, you have identified using the adjusted box plot is different and in fact you are now showing an outline on the lower side of the range as well. Okay, so which tool do you use will determine what kind of conclusions you are going to draw from that data. Okay, so you better know what tools are available and which is the appropriate tool for the given data. The next one is the violin plot which is uh, great, uh, which is available in the wire plot uh, library. The function is also wire plot. Again, you pass the same uh, vector, which is colored it, and so on. So what you get is not only the uh, a box plot, but actually you get a distribution of the data on the box itself. Okay, so you can see that there's a long tail on the right, and so on. Okay. Of course, next one is the most obvious way of visualizing generated data, which is a histogram. Okay, so this is a histogram with uh, labels uh, shown on the top. It can be created using the function hist. Okay, so I have hist. Uh, X label, Y label give me the labels on the axis. The scales on the axis are created by default, but you can always tweak it. You can you can specify all, everything that you want to, right? whether you want uh, so many breaks, you want uh, the range to vary from so and so, range and so on, all that can be specified. Okay, and labels to actually give me the labels as the, whatever is the height of the box. Histogram essentially gives you the frequency of each bin. Now, binning algorithms, there are several binning algorithms available. You can choose which one you want. This is the default. So, now I added onto that a curve, a density curve. Yeah? Sorry, to interrupt. Do you have the code available? It's all right here, right? Uh, I can give you the code as well, anyway. That's okay. No, no I mean, if it was like on GitHub or something, then I could just lower it. Because I have asked um, you. No, I have a technologically. Uh, rather slow person, so I can give you the no, okay, that's fine, that's fine. That's I, I don't go on get up, sorry. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, so you have histogram, and then you can add lines. You can add as many lines as you want, you can add another histogram on the top of this, and so on. So, I have set lines uh, created by the density function of BW. Now, 
earlier we had some, some inkling that the data had a long write tail. Now this histogram is actually showing you that there is probably another uh, histogram and along with the density function you, you can see that probably there is another population which is being mixed in this data. Right? So that's, that's the kind of information that you can get if you look at the same data differently. Okay. But I increase <coughs> the bins. Okay? Earlier I had, I had whatever were the default bins. Now what I'm doing is I have added number of breaks. I have added uh, more breaks in it and it's very clear now that this is a different population which has been mixed in the data. Okay. I go ahead and show you that in fact what I have done is a mixture of three populations. Okay. There is one population which is sitting right here. If you see there is a lack of symmetry in this data. Therefore there is another population which has been mixed out here and a third one which is here. Okay. All this is very empirical though. Right? I mean, I know that I have done it, therefore it's easy for me to tell you that this is how it is. Okay? So this is a mixture of densities. How do I sh show all this? Along with this, I am now, now showing you a, an adjusted box plot as well. Okay? I am using a single x-axis scale, a common x-axis. Okay? So I create a, another way of creating a layout is using a matrix. So I defined a matrix which has a single column and two rows. Layout works the other way around. Then I specify layout. Layout as per this matrix, because the matrix function goes column wise. So I create a layout as per this matrix, and the <coughs> heights and the widths can then be distributed between <coughs> each of the rows and columns of the matrix. So in this case, there are only heights. So I'm saying 80% of my plot area is this histogram and 20% is the box plot. Okay, so you can play with all these things. Then I am changing the margins of the plot area. So in the plot area, I am saying the margin should be 0 on the bottom for the uh, histogram, 4 on the left so that I have the axis, the labels, <coughs> and then the uh, axis label and the takes and so on. So I have 4 lines on the left, 3 on the top, 1 on the right. And box type is none, so I don't want any box around the histogram. Okay. Otherwise, by default, you get a box around the plots in most of the cases. So I got rid of that. There, I have put the histogram, and then I'm saying I want to plot the second axis. So in fact, when I when I plot the histogram, I actually say that axis is false. So no axis are actually drawn. So as I said, it's ink on paper, and you can specify what ink you don't want to put. So no axis are to be drawn. Then I say that I want to draw the y-axis. I don't want to draw the x-axis as yet. Then I go ahead and do the box plot. The box plot again has its own x-axis that takes care of my plot. Okay. Of course, I have done some more scaling so that uh, the histogram and the box plot ha uh, have a common scale. So in the histogram, I have specified that I want it to range from 0 to 35. Uh, sorry, 2 to 35. Uh, in fact, 0 to 35. Okay. So that in both the cases, the same scale is used. So that, that's how you can combine plots and so on. <coughs> and this is what a statistician would like to see, right? Uh, uh, QQ now, or, or what is the standard probability plot? That, that then clearly tells you that this is a mixture of data because this is deviating from the expected distribution of the population. So you have a QQ norm which got the point. There are too many points, therefore you, you are just seeing a blue line. And then there is a red line which I have added, which is the QQ norm, which is what one would expect if the data is normally distributed. And the two tails moving away are indicating that there are data from different, either the entire data comes from a different distribution or it's a mixture of distributions. And of course there are tests for actually knowing whether it's a mixture of distributions. Having talked about continuous univariate data, uh, let us look at discrete data, okay, categorical data. Data. Now this is topics most visited on English Wikipedia on 31st May 2013, the day after Ritupan Ghosh died. Okay. So obviously the views on him jumped up 
So you have him right at the second point, uh, second position. Interestingly, cat anatomy is also very popular. <laughs> and so on and so forth. How do you plot such a data? Now if you don't have too many, or if you give this kind of data to R, typically you <coughs> have a bar chart like this. So whatever, there are n points in the in the n n categories in the data. So I create a bar, uh, bar plot of the data. Now Wikidata, as I have in my uh, in my R, is actually a vector with labels as the names, names of the pages visited or the topics visited. Okay. So the, those labels would automatically appear in the bar plot. Again, I have specified that I want it horizontal, otherwise by default it would have been vertical. Then look at this, I added colors. Now there are various color palettes which are available by default in R. Uh, one is the rainbow, which takes you across the entire spectrum. Pretty dirty if you just say rainbow 5, you get 5 colors across the spectrum, but useful. Uh, topo colors is uh, the set of colors which are typically used in the topo sheets. Then there are, um, what else? There are topo colors, there are um, CM colors, then uh, what else? There are, there are some, several such uh, palettes. If you take help on any one of these, say rainbow, help rainbow or help topo colors, you will get all of them. Then I have added text as the labels. Okay? And uh, that, that, that gives me these labels on the, on the, on the bars. Okay, so whatever is the actual number of views on the bars have to be added as text in case of bar plot. In case of histogram, you could get the labels directly at the top of the uh, bars. In case of box plot, that is not a facility available, but you can easily do it by adding uh, free text there. Okay, uh, now another very popular kind of uh, showing this data is to have bars and accumulated view, right? view percentage and so on. So you want some two axes, right? On one axis you have the frequency, on the other axis you have the cumulative proportion. Okay. So I just create a PVT as a, as a cumulative sum of the proportions of sorted data of course. And then I go ahead and use a two odd dot plot. So on two odd null, I'm plotting it, then whatever. Then you, you have right and left, X and Y. You specify those and you get the plot. Am I running too fast? Is it okay? It's okay? Good. Thank you. So I hope I, I hope to finish something. Then of course you have the popular pie chart for this kind of data, which I hate being a statistician. You really don't know what is what or what is how much more than the other. You also have the, uh, what is it called, 3D blown pie chart or the exploded pie chart. So that's also available in pi 3D. You can use that. And then there is something called dot chart. Dot chart is useful when you have huge number of categories. Okay, so all that you show is a dot <coughs> against each, uh, each category. And then if there are a large number of categories, then they also compress into a small area and then you actually see a kind of curve or distribution. Okay. Now here I use the rainbow colors but then they don't show up very well on the blue background. That should be okay. Ah, the next data that I want to talk about is uh, bivariate categorical data. The data is on hair and eye color, eye colors of 500 students in a particular university. This is, an, uh, this is a data set available in uh, R. It's called a hair eye color. And uh, also it also has a third dimension of gender. What package is it? It's in this. So most of it, I mean, if I have not specified the package, it's uh, available in whatever the vanilla installation of R. <coughs> so obviously there are uh, several hair colors and eye colors, <coughs> and what is of interest is to find out what is the association between these colors, right? Okay. You pass this data to uh, 
to uh, bar plot and you get a stack bar. Okay, if I, if I do just bar plot, I get this kind of stack bar plot. Okay. Of course, I have uh, spiced it up a bit by adding colors. My colors, uh, I claim to match them up with the hair color, brown, blue, sorry, eye color, brown, blue, hazel, green. And then I have the hair color as the four bars. Then I added a legend on the right hand top. So this is how you add a legend. You can actually specify the x and y coordinates here. Or you could just say top right, top left and so on. And we'll just put it there. The legend says attributes of hair eye color. So what are the attributes of that? So from that I am extracting the dimension names. One dimension is of course hair color, the other dimension is eye color. I am extracting only the eye color dimension names. From that I am getting the four eye colors. Okay? And then coloring them using my colors. My color is just a vector which contains these four color names or four colors. Which correspond, to, which correspond to brown, blue, hazel and green. <coughs> if you want to show the same thing as a group bar, which is again a very popular way of showing it, then all that I do is to change the bar plot and add it, add to it, decide to do two. There is something else available in R to look at uh, bivariate categorical data and that is mosaic grid. Why bivariate? In fact, multivariate. So you can add add levels to this. So now this this plot is very very uh, informative. In the sense, it's very clear that blondes come in blue color, blue colored eyes, right? So most of the blondes would have blue colored eyes. It's very very obvious here. Brown goes with brown and brown goes with black. Okay, it's very obvious. Right, so mosaic is a good way of looking at categorical data and you can have multiple uh, categories, multiple levels but you just have to be careful about how you choose colors and make things look good otherwise it's best to leave them as just empty boxes and compare the areas of the boxes, heights and levels. Of course on each axis you also get to see what are the relative proportions of each of the dimensions in the category data. So the function is simple mosaic plot hair eye color anyway. Uh, next, we let us let us try to look at uh, a pretty old CARS data from 1973-74 models, fuel consumption and 10 aspects of automobile design and performance for 32 different automobiles from uh, the motor trend magazine. The data set is called empty cards. It is again available in R as a standard data set. Okay, so you can play around with that very easily. And uh, in case of a bivariate continuous versus categorical data, this is probably one, one, one way of visualizing the data that I like. Okay, so uh, more of what I am talking about addresses uh, what is the right kind of uh, plots, what are the right kind of plots for a given kind of data. So, well, here it is. If you, if you want uh, car mileage as a function of cylinders, okay, 4, 5, 6, no, I'm sorry, 4, 6, 8 cylinders, then, well, you just have a box plot of MPG as a function of cylinders, okay, using the data empty cars, and here you get it. Okay. Of course, I have added colors to that, but that's okay. You get the box plots. Okay, and there's probably one car which it's really, very really bad. So it has eight cylinders, lot of room, but no fuel efficiency. However, if I had two continuous variables, which is car mileage as a function of weight, then the appropriate plot is a scatter plot. Okay? And that's what you would get. I'm just showing you a slightly different way of uh, calling functions or, or structuring functions in R. And just saying with empty card, so that different columns in the data frame can be accessed in the function inside it directly by their names. So I don't have to say empty cars dollar away, empty cars dollar mpg, and so on and so forth. So it makes life easy. I just say with, so I enclose everything within that, and I'm just saying plotting weight against mpg. I have x labels, y labels, 
picture lets you uh, choose one of the what are 30 40 different symbols that are available you can also replace that with any <coughs> character any glyph that you want to use uh, color you can of course choose for the uh, plotted glyphs okay now on to that on any of any of the plots in fact there are three functions that you can use uh, just a pointer to that identify so once you say identify you can go and click on points and then it will give you what exactly that point is in terms of its x and y values okay so it will plot it will mark it there it will also give it give you that information on the console so some some interactivity of this kind is available and there's something called locator which can be used to locate text on the graph so if you want to specifically write some text and put it somewhere so you say locator and you click here it will put it here okay so you can manually add things into a plotted area typically kind of uh, what, what you do in Excel, I mean you want to add label here, there, you just take a text box and put it there, something like that. And then there is grid, which can add the grid lines, again something popular but not really always required. Okay, on to that, again some statistics, you have the scatter plot, you want to add a uh, regression line on it, a simple function AB line, using ls fit, d square fit of x versus y in the color red. So it's a straight line graph that has been added onto the scatter plot. You want to add a lowest which is a, which is a cubic uh, spline onto the uh, data, you can add that using just lines, pass the lowest function to it and plot the fitted line. Okay. So you can keep adding things onto a plot. So if you want you can add a histogram of car rates here itself, you can add a histogram of miles per gallon there and so on, all that can be done. There is a package called CART which does all these things in a go. There is a function scatter plot there. You just say MPG is a function of weight, the data is empty cards, and you get it. Okay? So you have the scatter plot, you have the, uh, this, this is a slightly different fitting function, so you get that, and you also get the, uh, you get the linear fit, and you also get box plots on the either side. Something that we have already constructed step by step in different cases. Okay, so all that is canned and readily available for you. <coughs> now, similar to the box plot, there is also a bivariate box, box plot which is called a back plot. Not really very interesting, but if you are interested, okay. it's available in the package APL pack. You just say back, back, back plot of weight and MPG. So, this is essentially creates an envelope of the inner 25% and the 75% data. 25, 50 and 75% uh, data and also shows the outline if you can see a red dot here. Okay. Scatter plot if, if you have a large number of data points then it just becomes a dirty dark cloud over there. Okay? And this outline on the shape of the cloud is all that really you get to know. Okay? <coughs> but you would be interested in also knowing what is the distribution of the density of those points in the way. Right. So, a very simple way of doing it is to play with the alpha transformation. Okay. So, in your plot, all that you can say is that the color is whatever RGB combination and a very low alpha. So, every plot is a pretty light disk. But as the, as the number of points keep increasing, the density goes up. Okay. That's, a, that's a very simple way of doing it. Quick and dirty. Okay. Here is a better way of doing it. There is something called hexagonal binning. Okay. So your two-dimensional data is now converted into some kind of a, of hexagons. Each hexagon has a color density or actually a color itself, which gives you how many points are actually there in that uh, bin. Okay. So there is a package called hex bin. You uh, <coughs> say hex bin of my y. Now I have generated a lot of data. So hex bin of x versus y, I want 50 bins. Okay. So it's in a way also a histogram. Okay. Each bin then is has certain frequency. And then you just plot it. So when you say plot the bin object, you get this kind of a plot. 
Now, this plot function is something that I have uh, introduced only once before when we plotted the scatter plot. Now, R is completely object oriented. So, depending upon what object you pass to the function, the function tends to be different. And that's, that's one beauty of, uh, say, the plot function. And hereafter, what we are going to look at is how plot function behaves if you pass different objects to it. Okay, so next couple of slides, we'll look at that. So first we saw that if you pass uh, two continuous data points uh, or two continuous vectors to uh, the plot function, you get a scatter plot. Next we are looking at a bin. Bin is, is a kind of, is, is it by itself a data structure. Okay, so its class would be bin. Uh, class would be hex bin in fact. So you plot uh, bin, you get this kind of plot. Next, there is a time series data. Okay, time series by itself is a different data structure or a, or a data type, data class in R. Okay, where you have associated time information with the series, data series. Okay, so I, I have picked up the El Nino uh, C surface temperature data, which is available in the T series uh, package. Now, this window function just pulls out certain subset of the data. This, this uh, Nino 3 contains data set for uh, I think last 50 years or something. I am looking at just 10 years data. So I, I just accepted a window of from 1990 to 2000 and I plot TT. Okay, TT is an object, a time series object. And I plot it, I get it plotted against time. Okay, otherwise I would have got this one to zero on the x-axis. Uh, next, of course, what I've done is identify, identified the peaks by clicking there. Okay. So that helps me identify what is the uh, frequency of, of the cycles and you can, you can very well see that in the year 1998, the cycle got disturbed and he had dropped. And then, of course, you can add text also. So if, if I were not to do identify, then I could have used text and function to find the local maxima and marked it out there. Okay. Next is decomposition of the new 3 data set. Okay. The decompose function in time series decomposes the time series into uh, the trend, the seasonal effect and the random effect. Okay. So if I, if I say I want to plot the decomposed new series, I get four plots together. That's what it does to a decomposed object. Okay. So a decomposed object would plot as four, four different things. The observed series itself, the trend, the seasonality, and the random. So that's what plot does. If I have, an, if I have a multivariate data, Iris is probably one of the most commonly used uh, demo data sets in R. Okay. This uh, the data data has its own history. Uh, R. A. Fisher uh, is supposed to have collected this data on iris plots of three different species of iris called uh, Cestosa, Virginica and Versicolor. And uh, the, the data set is contains some 150 points, 50 on each of the plots. And there are four measurements. Sepal length, sepal width, petal length and petal width. Okay. So there are, there are these three different species of plots. And uh, if, you, if you just pass the data set iris to the plot function, what you get is this kind of a matrix of plots. So if every single plot is, say for example this one is petal length versus petal width and so on. And of course to make it uh, very obvious, what I've added is color. Color as iris for the species. So every point takes the color of its species. Okay. So it's very clear that uh, this is uh, Cestosa because I know. So this is Cestosa and it stands out very well on the petal length itself. Petal length versus petal width. Okay, it has a distinctly smaller petal lengths and petal widths. But if you look at these two, the, the there is there is some kind of confusion, right? So there, there, there is very similar, a lot more similarity between Virginica and Versicolor than with Cestosa. Now this data set has been used for demonstrating performance capabilities of um, whatever logistic regression, uh, decision trees and clustering and so on and so forth. Any classifying algorithm and they tested on this and well, 
nobody really can differentiate the two species purely on the basis of these four measurements. Okay. Next is a linear model. Okay. A lot of lot of you might have heard of, might have used linear regression. So you have simple linear model of MPG as a function of weight. Okay. If you pass the linear model object to the plot function, you get these four plots. Okay. It of course gives you one plot at a time and you have to just keep pressing enter. So instead of doing that, I have just created a 4x4 four four or rather 2x2 two two grid. So plot area is a 2x2 two two grid and then it plots all the four in a single row. Okay. So different objects are passed to the plot function, plot method and you get different kinds of plots. Here you get all the, all the necessary things that you would want to see about a regression object. Same thing again. I have, I have done uh, clustering of the empty cars data. Okay? And then the next thing that I have done is plotted the cluster object. You get a dendrogram. Entirely different objects, you get entirely different plots using the, the same plot function. So which plot should I, what kind of plot should I have? What kind of graph should I have? Well, use the plot method, you will know at least that's what good statisticians say they would do. This is agree, again the same thing. I use, use the package rbar to uh, create the decision tree and I pass the r part uh, object to plot function, I get a decision tree. What I've done is here, of course, is to use rpart.plot package which gives you a PRP function which is which gives a much better looking uh, tree. So you can use PRP as well. Otherwise you get a very very plain looking tree using plot function. This is of course good enough for exploratory work. Next you have financial time series. It's a multivariate data because you have the open, low, high, close series. It's a time series data again. So against time. So this kind of data can be fetched and worked upon using the quantmod package. Quantmod package is a, is a kind of wrapper package over all the typical functions that one uses uh, when handling financial data. So you can actually start by getting the symbols. Use get symbols of say, in this case, Yahoo series, Yahoo stock from certain date and then I'll plot it. There is a function called chart series. <coughs> so you get what is typically shown. The prices, the candles are the open low high close and uh, on the lower pane you have the volume of uh, stock which was Where does it get the data from? It gets from the, uh, in this, this, this particular I think the default is uh, finance.yahoo.com but you can uh, choose. There are several series that you can get from. So you, so there are, you want there are on slurp the HTML tables of. Uh, I saw there was a manual method where you could slurp uh, HTML tables of finance.yahoo as well. You can do that. You can always do that. I mean, you use curl, you take whatever you want to take and then keep cleaning it. You can always do that. But then there, is, there are uh, I mean, calls to the APIs. You can do that. So you have multivariate data in mixed mode and you want to visualize that. <coughs> Probably the plot function and the base functions which are available are not good enough for that. Okay? So that's why you should start looking at two of the most commonly used packages. One is the lattice, which essentially is based on the idea of conditioning. Okay? So you have a data series, given a particular variable, what would the rest of the variables look like? Okay. So it, it's conditioning on the values taken by one or more of the variables in the data set. The commonly available or used methods in that I start xy plot, level plot and we use panel functions. We'll look at those. And the other one is ggplot2. Okay. The package is ggplot2. Uh, people would typically refer to as just ggplot, which is implementation of, <coughs> of graphics in R. Okay. <clears throat> in a sense, this is uh, ultimate of what you can do with plotting because it has everything segregated out. 
and you know exactly what you are working with when you do a particular thing. Okay. So uh, when he was presenting about uh, degree.js, etc., uh, it's very easy to relate each uh, activity that you do there with which component are you really touching in graph of graphics. Okay. So whether it is the data, whether it is the aesthetics, whether it is the geometry, geometry meaning whether it is a point or a line and so on and so forth. Or whether it is the specific operation, whether it is a box plot that is create a histogram or binning or whatever it is. Then whether it is the scales, okay, what kind of uh, scales, logarithmic scale or etc. that you want to use. Then the facets, meaning the conditioning that I talked about in lattice, the same thing, facets. The coordinates, whether you want a, uh, <coughs> an Euclidean coordinate system or a, or a what is it called? Gradient mm -hmm. basically. Etc. And then there are certain options that you also have always available to play with. Okay, so this is your X5 plot in the latest package. This is slightly different data set on car's resale price as a function of mileage and model. Okay, so there are cars which go to a large reseller okay. and he has to set prices of each new car that he, each old car that he buys and wants to resell. So what should be, what is the right resale price that he should set on every new car that he wants to sell, every old car that he wants to sell. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the problem that we, we are working with. Okay, so in the past he has this data, uh, he has uh, data on several models the price is on the y-axis and each individual panel is a plot for each model. Okay? And the scatter plot uh, in almost all cases shows you that that's all that you really need to look at. Right? Mileage versus price. Maybe the year of make would be another dimension but it's almost not there. Right? The mileage takes care of it probably. probably. So, how do you plot that? You just say require lattice so that gives you the, you start using the, uh, the package. And then just say xy plot of price as a function of mileage given the model. Okay? A typical set, uh, way of seeing in statistics. So, price as a function of mileage given model. And given model gives you a panel for each model and that's it. Okay. And now what I am going to do is to add regression lines for each panel. Okay. How do I do that? I add a panel function. So for each panel I am saying add a function. So first thing is just the xy plot, that is the scatter plot. So that adds the blue dots or bullets and then panel LM line, linear model line, x versus y. Span is equal to 1 means that each regression line is going to span a single model. You could actually change the layout and actually say that I want this regression line to span across two uh, plots and so on and so forth as well. Okay, so that can also be done, and then I'm coloring it and so on. Next, if you have continuous versus several categorical variables, okay, so on my uh, x-axis also I have categories, variety of barley, okay. So this this is one famous uh, barley uh, experiment. So it's a design of experiment uh, kind of example where uh, barley production was to be increased, obviously. And uh, so they, they, they experimented with several varieties in several different uh, sites. So the, e each plot is for a site. So read Grand Rapids, Duluth, University of Rome, and so on and so forth. Okay. So you have a plot for each site. And for each variety, I have just plotted a single point. Okay. Now, this obviously, I mean, if you were to plot a scatter or all of them together and so on, a very interesting fact would not 
become absolute. Now, if you look at the colors of the plots, you will see that there is something fishy going on at Morris. Okay, another, another dimension was of course year, 1931 and 1932. Okay. What you will ob observe is that only at Morris, the blue dots are higher up than the red uh, or the pink rectangles. In all other cases, the rectangles are higher. Right, so that, that could very well be a data issue, but this becomes very apparent if you use the right plot. Okay, so what, what I do is, this, this part was clear, yield as a function of variety given sites, data is valid. Now, on top of that, I am saying groups are years. When you say groups are years, another panel is not created, or another level of panels is not created. What is done is, two different series are plotted within each panel. Okay. And this again could be a combination of several fields in the data. So those many series would be plotted, and then those are identified here. I want them stacked, so I have all the graphs stacked one above the other. Otherwise, typically it would have been a 3 by 2 kind of a grid that would have been created. Then, I added the key to the right, so auto key is this. Arguments to auto key have, uh, you can give a lot many things in that, so it is faster than this. On the right space, it gives the space on the right. And then x and y labels. And then to rotate the x axis labels, I am using rotate label buffer. So I am rotating the labels by other things. The same <coughs> iris data. If I were to plot using uh, one of the easier functions in ggplot, would look like this. Okay, there's a function called qplot. So what I pass to it is just circle length, comma, petal length, and the data iris, and color by species. So I'm plotting only one panel out there in the in the grid that we had seen. Okay, just the petal length versus the circle length, and I'm coloring them by the data iris, uh, data species. Further, I am specifying that the size of the bullets should be in proportion to the petal width. Okay? Therefore, the bullet sizes are varying. And then I have added an alpha for transparency in the bullets because once you start getting bigger bullets, then they start fudging into each other. So, you don't want that. And then on the right side, you automatically get what is the scale and what is the identifier and so on and so forth as well. Okay. In fact, what I have used is, uh, in, the, in the size I have using log of petal width, not petal width. If I use the petal width, the bullets are much larger. Okay, if you have several time series to be plotted together, using again the qplot function, this is what you get. Okay, there, there, is a, there is a data set called orange available in, again, ggplot, uh, which is uh, growth of orange trees, annual growth rate. So that's the age and the circumference of the tree uh, stem. Okay, that's what is being plotted. And for, for uh, what are five different trees. Okay, so you get these five lines. And this is the default uh, plotting of such data in ggplot using the qplot method. But that's not uh, really all. Okay, let, let, let me have, show you another, another qplot. Okay. Uh, there's another data set called diamonds. Okay. So in the diamonds data set, you have price, carrot, cut, and several other fields in fact. So uh, price is considered a function of uh, the carrot and the cut, typically. So, okay, the cuts are Greater as for the ideal premium, very good, good fare. Okay. So the fair cut diamonds can have large carrots, but the ideal cut usually do not have large carrot sizes, but the prices are high. Okay, which is what, what people who buy diamonds would know. I won't. Uh, but that, that's what they type. And you actually, what I've done is added a geometry. Okay, we talked about grammar of uh, graphics, and there we had a, something called geometry. Now here, I have not left it to uh, ggplot to determine what, what geometry is to plot. I have said that I want points, 
handle and a smooth curve. So it has fitted a smooth curve for each of the subsets of data, subset created by is it the cut and the cat. Okay? So I get five different lines, those are curves, and you'll see how the prices uh, do change. So that okay. But that's that's not that's not the entire story. Okay, as I said, ggplot gives you controls on all the six seven things that I spelled out. Those seven things are the defaults that are already available. Then layers. So e each thing is a layer that I'm stacking on onto the plot. And there are of course scales and the coordinate system. Each layer by itself is defined by the data, the mapping that you want, what against what. Okay. The geometry will be used that we have looked at a bit the statistics that you want to create and then use and the position you want to have on the entire plot area. We will take one example where I am uh, going to expand this particular uh, ggplot into each of these components and demonstrate. I am running a bit short on time if I want to cover uh, gra uh, plotting on uh, maps and so on and, and showing some interactive things but let's see how, how I speed it up. So what we want to do <coughs> is to plot, <coughs> create a plot something like this, okay? Which is a human development uh, index versus the corruption index. Okay, this is data available from UNDP. You can download it for every year. This is 2011. Okay, FBI versus CPI, country wise. So for each country, you have the human development index and the uh, corruption perception index. Okay, and then we are also uh, there are, of course, every country belongs to a certain region, whether it is uh, America, the APAC, or the <coughs> Africa, and so on. Okay. <coughs> and then you want to add some kind of a fitting curve on that. Okay. So let's go ahead and do it. So first thing that we do, okay, now ggplot, as well as lattice, in fact, uh, is actually an object that you create. And then finally you say that I want to print this object. Okay. So ggplot, I am creating this object as PC1, as just a ggplot of using what data? The data series is stored in a, a data object called DAT, a data frame called DAT. So that's what I am plotting. Now AES, AES stands for aesthetics. So what are the aesthetics that, that I want? AES means, aesthetics means whatever is being shown. Okay, rest you can supply and it will not be plotted. So it will start do the calculations for it. So aesthetics is, on the x-axis I want the CPI, on the y-axis I want uh, HDI and I want to color the points by the regions to which they belong. Very similar to what we have done earlier in case of a plot function. Okay. Nothing new. Then, now this is where it starts looking different. I add to that. Okay. Geometry of the points is using a particular shape. Okay. So similar to the PCH argument in uh, plot, we have uh, shape and there are various shapes which are by default available. You can also add your own. Next, I want to specifically add labels of certain countries there, which are of interest or appearing different. So I, I create a vector of labels. So I have a Chad, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Bhutan, and so on. Okay, and then I again go ahead and add to PC one geometry called text. So which is what we would have done using the text function in case of the base plotting function. Again, aesthetics because I want to actually put it on paper with labels as countries. Okay, so that's what it will do. I want it in black color of size 3. Horizontally adjust. So against the point where, where, is, it, where is it that you want to place the uh, text that is what I am specifying. Then the data to be used is only the subset of data available in the labels list. Okay? Otherwise, it will try to fit anywhere. <coughs> then finally, I am adding a smooth line geometry to it, which is essentially a polynomial fit. The method is linear model. Okay, so here you can actually specify what kind of methods to use. You can actually create your own function and pass. 
right? Again, color in black. And the formula to be used is a polynomial of second order. Is that place where you can get the list of methods? Oh, is there in the GG part? And as I said, you can create your own as well. Okay. And then finally, uh, by default, what you, have what you would have got is the, is the typical gray background with grid lines on it that you were seeing in the earlier Q plots. Okay. Instead, I want the black and white theme. So there are different default themes available as well. Or you can create your own theme again. So I use the theme uh, VW. And then I want a scale on scale x continuous. This is says that I want the x axis label as whatever consumption, perception, index to third level, and 10 is least, and so on. Okay. Same thing on the y axis labels. And then the legend earlier in the earlier plots, if you remember, the legion was appearing on the right. Now this I want to move to the top. Okay. So what I'm saying is legion position is uh, top. And the direction is horizontal, otherwise you have kept the entire block on the top. So that, that's how you can play around. Next, what I want to show is the iGraph package. In the iGraph package, uh, iGraph package is used for uh, analyzing uh, graphs, that is graph theory graphs, networks, and so on. Okay. Uh, there is an excellent iGraph demo function available in the iGraph package itself. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to do anything more than that ever. So just run that demo and look at that. There are different types of graphs that you can uh, in different nature of structures of uh, graphs. You can look at those and uh, see a very, very nice demo of that. This particular one is social network of friendship between 34 members of karate club in the US. So tries to show what is the cohesion, what is the leadership in the team, uh, in the network and so on. Next thing that I wanted to show is our Google Maps. Okay. With our Google Maps, you can uh, extract a Google Map give it given its center, the that long, and the zoom level. You can also specify the uh, boundaries. And you, you, you can specify the type, the type of map that you want. You get that map, and then on that map, you, you obviously save it as, as a as a PNG file. You map false essentially says that if you have downloaded it once, don't download it again. Okay, I have a data frame uh, called QLog. It's a data frame with latitude, longitude, and attribute in plotted. Now, this particular case was uh, was actually a, a, a tiny work that I had to do for an ecologist. So they they, they do surveys on various uh, locations. For, I mean, this, is, this is a typical activity which is done before any project is approved on the ecological uh, aspect these days. So they have to survey the, the area from the ecological perspective. And what is, what is plotted right now here is what is called the Shannon's diversity index. Okay. So every point uh, was, was a survey site. And uh, the attribute plotted was the Shannon diversity index for that particular point. And again, the uh, plotted points are uh, uh, again, the size as well as the color is a function of the index itself. Okay, so the function used this plot on static map. The arguments are very similar to any other plot function. Okay, there is another package called SP okay, for plotting spatial data. And that's a very powerful package. Uh, you can fetch uh, map data at various granularities. So every 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 uh, geological survey or, or uh, geographical survey, so GIS maps that are available are now available in this format. So our data format itself is being offered by most of the surveys. So you can pick the plot areas from them directly. This is the URL gdan.org, and they in fact go and point to individual countries' uh, own. Service, services itself. Okay. So, uh, you, uh, sorry, uh, survey, not, not general service, so survey. Uh, so, this is this is a this is a uh, obviously a graph of uh, Switzerland, and which area 
he is predominantly uh, of which language people. So there is a vector of languages for each county or district, whatever it is, in case of Switzerland. And I'm, I'm just using the terrain color, use SP plot on this GDAM object, and you get nicely colored areas. A beautiful, much better implementation of that is this. This is uh, unemployment data. This is called a coroplet. So every 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 uh, district in US has been colored using that. So it's just a 15 lines of uh, code. The person who has created it, it has used RBDAL color schemes and R color group packages. Not necessary, you can do it just with SP and, and your base uh, color palettes. Then this kind of representation might be interesting. Then for interactive graphs, there are packages available. One is GGOBI, but it is more of a teaching tool. I would have liked to show it, but now we are running short of time. There is another thing called R plus I plots. This uh, has, a, has a Java uh, interface for plots. Then there are two other projects. One is R Apache package, which can be used to create R web service. The other one is Shiny. Okay. Shiny has uh, basically two scripts. One is the UI script and the other is the uh, server script. Server script is where you do the analysis. UI script is where you just uh, create the server page. Okay. And you just call the run app for that given directory and uh, that's it. It will run. I can probably show that. I'll how much time are you giving me? 5 minutes. 5 minutes, then I won't run it. You can do it later on. Okay. Then there is also R plus Google chart tools using Google Wiz. Okay. So essentially the Google uh, motion charts and so on, those can be called. So what, what happens is you do your analysis, finally plot it in using GWiz motion chart or whatever and yeah, it's rendered in the browser. Then I'll, I'll show you a couple of posters, which is what would probably be a good kind, kind of target output of your hackmates. It's pretty heavy PDF, so it might take a while to render. So all the plots out here, including plotting on the maps, is done using uh, ggplot. This is, in fact, uh, he mentioned. This one is uh, again created by the creator of uh, ggplot who so was involved in this project. Hadley Weldon. That's essentially all that I have. I'll leave you with this. This is the Facebook connectivity graph which was created a couple of years ago by somebody at Facebook itself. A similar graph uh, I can show you a code for. That's it.
Okay. Okay. So, so you do the analysis, you get a JSON. So that is fine, but why not use the grammar that is there within the ggplot in order to represent the integer JS? What does that take? Why, why, why do you want to then go out of ggplot? So, I mean, it's a language for representation. Anyway, we can take this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so the other question is, uh, we discussed about the classification of iris flaps. Mm -hmm. If these three data, the petal length, sepal length, and the petal, uh, all of this is not enough for representation of classification. What is the base, actual basis for the classification? Biologist. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, right? Yeah. You go back to the domain people, right? So, no. You go back to the domain people saying that, okay, this data yeah. can give you this level of classification. If you want more, give me more data. Exactly. Which is meaningful, relevant, etc. from the domain point of view. So my question, the reason the question came up was maybe the classification of a biologist is wrong. If, if there is a natural clustering at a certain point and if the biologist says this belongs to this, maybe the biologist. Maybe, or in fact, that's how people actually say that there is actually a third, fourth species available. Okay. That's how people do that. I mean, that, that, that's, that's a valid research methodology. All right, so on the last one, uh, for the spatial data, getting the JSON and representing it on the space, uh, on spatial data is not a big problem, but uh, where is the data available for storing all of these, uh, you know, the, the diagrams, the districts of the United States, for example, whatever you earlier displayed. So where is the data available for this? This is Yeah, the representation. This part should be green, this part should be that. The oh, individual district, how they are represented. Okay, is so that also a part of the package itself, or we have to explicitly get it? Or, and then if you do it, if you want to do it for a country other than the United States, where is a similar form of data available for the rest of that? Yeah, so the, the language vector is actually a vector corresponding to the uh, districts. Okay, so I would have a data frame of district versus district in the one column and the uh, attribute that you want to plot in the second column. That's right. Okay, so that's the data frame. And so I look up the district and uh, color the district accordingly. That, that's what this does. The SP plot does that. The SP plot has a built-in information in order to understand this part is Washington, this part is New York, or whatever. See, the the uh, the GDM that has been GADM, which has been extracted from the URL, okay, that is a list data structure. Right. Okay. It contains apart from the identifier, which is the district number or whatever it is, it also contains information in terms of what are the boundaries of that district. Right? Essentially the XY coordinates. Okay, several XY coordinates together. In different ways, they can be represented. So, that, that, that I mean, uh, have you heard of shape files? Right. So, it's a shape file. The shape files are built in into the data set. So, that, no, the shape file is held as, uh, as a data structure, as a, as a data structure in GDA. Okay. okay, so there's a shape file, and then there's, there, there are the identifiers for each each shape, and against those identifiers, I have the attribute. Are the shape files available for other parts of the world? Yes. yes. Okay. And up to a pretty good. Uh, you can have it at, uh, I think, even Tarsil level like in India. Any so. questions? questions? Uh, I did talk a little bit about the beaming algorithms. Uh, you said there are multiple beaming algorithms. Uh, times. In Instagram? Uh, yeah. so. Just take help of Instagram. <coughs> of something like Gremlin or a graph database and plot it using the iGraph, right? Is there a way of normalizing the data output out of something like Gremlin or Neo4j for example, or Cypher? If I want to take data out of a graph database, because it all comes in the form of vertexes and interconnected vertexes. Is there an interface that R provides for normalizing that kind of data? iGraph again is more about uh, analyzing and doing all these things than about plotting. And plotting is of course one aspect of it. Mm. Or is just one aspect of it. So for okay. relational data where you have relationships between objects, <coughs> what is a very good package to go for if I want to visualize it? Relational meaning what? Okay. Uh, let's say there are two objects. There is uh, two way relationships between both. Mm. So if I want a same visualization, because what happens when a 
with a JavaScript library like let's say arbor.js where you try to plot out a graph with complexity it's very hard to filter stuff out. Questions? Cool. That's why I love. I don't know if it was for one.